Earlier in the semester, I had introduced to you uh, Maxwell's equations here, and uh, I had promised that we'd revisit them. I know that you've all been anxiously waiting for that day, and I'm happy to announce that it's arrived. So here we've got Maxwell's equations, which, as you know, are the unified laws that between the four of them, they completely described electricity and magnetism really at their most fundamental level. And um, we now know almost everything we need to know to just be able to read these things in English. And that's kind of the, the as far as I want to take this, is I just want you to be able to read these and understand what they're saying. Um, and let's just pause for a second and realize how far we've come. Originally, we didn't know what this symbol X meant. We didn't know what this E with a vector over it. We didn't know that that was a cross product. We didn't know that that was the E field. We didn't know what this symbol mu meant. We didn't know what this H meant. We still got a little bit to go. We don't know what this uh, uh, triangle is, and this operator is new to us. So the first thing we want to know is, well, uh, what are these two new symbols? This is called the del operator. And this symbol here uh, means to take a partial derivative. And I, I want to start just by looking at the partial derivative and explaining what that is. Uh, so say we have a function. It's, of, uh, it's a multivariate function, meaning it's got uh, several independent variables, in this case x, y, and z. Uh, so for example, a multivariate function might be x squared plus xy plus x y squared z. And I might say to you, OK, students, take the uh, the derivative of this, df dx, and uh, if you're astute, you would say, well, uh, Professor Turner, that's not exactly right. If I'm taking the derivative of a function with respect to only one variable, I have to write it as a partial derivative. So I have to say, what function am I taking the derivative of f? What am I taking the derivative with respect to x? So to do that, to take a partial derivative, you just... Um, treat the function as if all the variables are constants except for the variable of which you want to take the derivative with respect to. So in this case, the partial of f with respect to x, we want to treat x as the differentiable variable. So that's going to be 2x plus the derivative of x is just 1 times y, and the derivative of x is 1, so times y squared z. And similarly, I could take the derivative of f with respect to y. And uh, there is no y there, so the derivative of that is 0. Uh, the derivative of y is 1. And the derivative of y squared is 2y. And then uh, for completeness, we could take the derivative of that same function with respect to z. So 0, 0, and then xy squared. So those are partial derivatives. Uh, that allows us to now understand this, which is called the del operator. Uh, it's an upside down delta. The name of that function is called the nambla, or the name of that symbol is called the nambla. The function is called the del, and del is just shorthand for a vector notation. That is, we take the partial derivative x, a hat x, plus partial derivative with respect to y, a hat y, plus partial derivative with respect to z, a hat z. So you see this del is actually an operator. It means do this to whatever is following it. Uh, so it's not actually a quantity, it's an operator. Just like addition is an operator or a derivative is an operator, it means do something to a function. We can use it two ways. One is called the cro vector cross product and one is called the vector dot product, which we've already explained what crosses and dots are. And so your first vector is just the del vector, and you can either cross it with a vector or you can dot it with a vector. So in essence, it's a shorthand notation in vector calculus that represents taking a partial derivative of vector quantity, and we can use that del operator in one of two forms, del cross or del dot. But what do those mean? What in the world do those mean? So before we understand del cross and del dot, we have to introduce a new concept. And that is the concept of flux. And uh, flux is just kind of like the amount of stuff that exits or enters a uh, surface. And we can have both a magnetic flux and we can have an electric flux, which are just how much magnetic field or how much electric field is going to pass through a given surface area.
So the way that I like to explain this is imagine that you have a butterfly net and you hold it up in the air. Well, the amount of air that moves through the net at any given time is the flux. It's air moving through the net. If the wind speed is high, your flux is going to be large. If the wind speed is low, the flux is going to be small. Alternatively, if we made the net large, the flux is going to increase for the same wind speed. If we decrease the size of the butterfly net, our flux is going to decrease. Finally, for the most wind to move through the net, it makes kind of intuitive sense that the net has to be perpendicular to the wind direction. If I were to hold a butterfly net parallel to the earth, and therefore parallel to the direction of wind, it wouldn't catch any wind. So flux, this concept of how much stuff, how much electric field or how, mag how much magnetic field enters or exits a surface, is going to depend on the size of the surface. It's going to depend on the angle of the surface to the direction of the movement of the field. And it's also going to determine on the magnitude of the source field. So that's this concept of flux. It's how much quantity of something, of some sort of vector quantity, is moving through a boundary. And we can have magnetic flux and we can have electric flux. So divergence, or del dot, this del dot operator, which is called the divergence, What does divergence tell us? Well, it tells us the flux density. It tells us, it basically is telling us, is a point a source of flux or is it a sink of flux? Like, is, is, is that point in space receiving more electric field than it's putting out or is it sourcing more electric field than it's getting? So we say that uh, positive divergence means a location or a point is a source of flux. And negative divergence here, if the product of this is negative, it means that it's a sink of flux. So um, is a point getting denser with a quantity in time, or is it getting less dense uh, in, as a quantity of time? Is flux leaving, or is flux entering? So that's the concept of del dot, or the divergence. Uh, the second concept relates to del cross, which is called the curl of a vector field. And curl measures a quantity called uh, circulation. And uh, circulation is the net twisting activity along a boundary. And the, the way that I like to describe this is imagine that you put a hula hoop in a whirlpool. Uh, if, if the if we put the whirlpool, we put the hula hoop in this whirlpool, and what's going to happen is the hula hoop is going to spin. Um, that's because there's a net circulation along the boundary, there's this twisting area along the boundary that the hula hoop defines. If you put the, the same hula hoop in a river, it won't spin. It's just pushed in the same direction. And so therefore, there's no circulation. So circulation is how much spinning is occurring in a vector field. And a cross product uh, gives us what is called the circula circulation density. It's how much spin is occurring per unit area. So if we were to shrink that hula hoop down to the size of a Cheerio, it would still twist. Um, we, uh, we've defined curl, how much twisting there is per unit area. So now we have all the tools we need to explain Maxwell's equations fully. Equation one tells us that if... If a magnetic field varies with time, an electric field will be produced. The size of the electric field and the spatial variation of the electric field are determined by the curl operation. And this is basically Faraday's law. We also have to take into account the material properties of the region of space in which the magnetic field exists. So time variant magnetic field will produce an electric field and the size and direction of the electric field, the size and spatial variation of electric field are determined by this curl operation, which would just take the cross product of the E field with the uh, del operator. Equation two here tells us that if we have an electric field that varies with time, 
um, a magnetic field will be produced. It also tells us that if we have a current, a magnetic field will be produced. The size and the spatial variation of the magnetic field are also determined by the curl operation, and this is Ampere's law. Equation 3 here tells us that if we take a volume of space, the divergence of the E field in that space is given by the total um, charge contained in the space divided by the electric permittivity of the space. And uh, this one's a little confusing. What it's basically saying is that uh, uh, electric fields radiate away from charge. And if I were to define some sort of boundary, I see that the flux here is always leaving. Electric field E uh, positive charges radiate E fields. So they are sources of electric flux. And they have a positive divergence. Equation 4 tells us that if we take a volume of space, the divergence of the B or the E, the uh, the divergence of the magnetic field there is always zero. And what that is saying is is that lines of magnetic field form closed loops. So if I have a little magnet here, and I take some representative boundary, the the lines of magnetic flux that leave also come back. They curl back upon themselves. And so if I were to sum all these lines up, that's positive divergence. That's negative divergence. They cancel each other out. That's positive divergence. That's negative divergence. They cancel each other out. So line, lines of electric field leave point charges. Uh, lines of magnetic field return back to their origin. There is a net divergence due to point charges. There is no net divergence due to uh, magnetic fields. And so now you know kind of in uh, layman's terms what Maxwell's equations are stating to us.